Good afternoon. My name is Tyler Sams. I'm one of the preachers for the Judson Road Church of Christ in Longview, Texas. We're continuing our study in the book of Psalms today. This is our seventh study, so thank you for joining with me today. Uh, in the past, we have been looking at some of the different Hebrew characteristics in the book of Psalms. We've looked at some of these peculiar Hebrew terms that are used. We've looked at the overall design and structure of the book. And today, having all of that information in our back pocket, what we want to do is actually get into the text of Psalms. And so what we want to do today is take the tools that we have accrued up to this point and use them to analyze and understand Psalm 1. A great place to start, seeing as it is the beginning place of the book of Psalms. And so let's start that right now. Let's read the first psalm together. Psalm 1, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. And it reads like this. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. A simple psalm, there's, there's nothing super in-depth here. Uh, it's a brief psalm, it's one that's easily digestible, so let's, let's get an overview of this psalm. The first thing we can say about this psalm is it's a psalm of orientation, right? We, we talked earlier in previous lessons about psalms of orientation, psalms of disorientation, and psalms of reorientation. We're not seeing the characteristics of disorientation or reorientation. We're not seeing the characteristics of a lament psalm or a hymn psalm or a thanksgiving psalm. This is a psalm of orientation. It states where we are in relationship to God. It, it praises him for the, the general order that he has brought into effect. And it's a fitting introduction for this entire book of Psalms. Uh, unlike Psalm 51, Psalm 23, Psalm 22, this is a psalm that does not have an author attached to it, and it's a psalm that does not have a circumstance attached to it, uh, which lends this to be understood as just a general truth. Uh, this is the beginning of the book of Psalms. We're emphasizing the concept of, of wisdom and the law of God and the blessedness of holding to God's law. This really sets the stage for the rest of the book of Psalms. This sets the stage, really, uh, for when we get into these laments and when we get to the thanksgivings and when we get to the hymns. It all springs from this point right here. And so what we're, we're kind of unlocking here in Psalm 1 is the secret to blessedness. And that's how most translations are going to render it in verse 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk on the counsel of the wicked. Uh, some translations are going to use the word happy. I don't know that that's the best translation, but Lord willing, we're going to have some studies on this particular word blessed in the future, so we're not going to make a whole lot of comments about it right now. But we've got a psalm of orientation. This fits, you remember, with the design of the first five books, of, uh, or, or, the, or the five books, rather, in Psalms, right? Uh, book one, book two, book three, book four, book five. In books two and three, remember, we're going down in books four and five, we're reorienting. But book one really tends to, to express this orientation, this initial orientation. And certainly this psalm seems to accomplish just that. So let's get into the psalm and break it down a little bit. Uh, let's look at verses one and two. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law he meditates day and night. Uh, this is what we call that antithetic parallelism or that contrasting parallelism. The man in verse 1 does not do X, Y, Z, but in verse 2, this is what he does. We've got a contrast. Here's what he's not. Here's what he is. Here's what he does not do. Here's what he does. And as you look specifically at verse 2, you're going to see an example of synthetic parallelism. His delight is in the law of the Lord. But then synthetic parallelism goes beyond the first line and, and completes it. 
His delight is in the law of the Lord. And here's the completing statement. In his law, he meditates day and night. Uh, this blessed man's delight in God's law is inseparable from his constant involvement in it. We're not looking at two different separate characteristics of the same man here. We're looking at two characteristics which are inextricably linked in this same person. His delight is in God's law. And because his delight is in God's law, he meditates in it day and night. He meditates in it day and night because his delight is in the law of the Lord. One of the key things with parallelism is we're not bringing in multiple ideas with parallelism. We're expressing a consistent idea. Here is a man who delights, who has involvement, uh, who finds meaning and purpose in the law of God. That's what's being expressed to us here in this synthetic parallelism in verses 1 and 2. Uh, look over with me to verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4 employ similes to communicate the message. You notice verse 3, He will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water. The wicked, verse 4, are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Uh, similes explicitly compare two concepts uh, by highlighting their similarities using words, uh, uh, using the words like, or as, or than. So we're having this explicit comparison between the righteous and a tree, between the wicked and chaff. What is chaff? Uh, chaff is the husk of wheat, or we might be more familiar with corn, uh, which is separated to get to the desired product, right? You want the ear of corn, and so you tear the husk away. Uh, you want the, the meat of the wheat, and so you tear the husk away. Well, what do you do with the husk? Well, if you've ever shucked corn before, and I know I remember doing this, you would just shuck it, you'd pull the husk off, and basically discard it. Uh, with wheat, uh, you would separate it by throwing it into the air, and, and the meat of the wheat would fall down, whereas the husk would be carried away by the wind. And that's really the picture here. Uh, you have in verse 3, the righteous that are firmly planted... Verses, verse 4, the wicked who are chaff, they're driven away. They have no standing. They have no belonging. They have no security. They're just blown away. They're gone. Versus the righteous, they're standing firmly by streams of water. They're yielding fruit. The leaf does not wither, and they're prospering. And when you look at verse 4, the wicked are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. You've got an example here of what we talked about uh, in previous lessons, that emblematic parallelism, where one line presents a simile, uh, the thought of the other line. The righteous are not so. They are like the chaff. They are like the chaff. There's our simile, which the wind drives away. You've got the wicked which do not have uh, a place of belonging versus the righteous who have a place of belonging and who have security. Verses 5 and 6, here's the ending thought. Here's where it's all pulled together. Verses 5 and 6 demonstrate what we talked about earlier as being chi uh, chiastic parallelism. What is chiastic parallelism? It's parallelism that takes the form of A, B, B, A. That's easily seen here in verses 5 and 6. Look at it with me. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. There's our A, B, B, A. It's wicked, righteous, righteous, wicked. In the first phrase of, of verse 5, we're talking about the wicked. The second phrase of verse 5, we're talking about the righteous. The first phrase of verse 6, it's the righteous. The second phrase of verse 6, it's the wicked. Now, remember what we said earlier with parallelism. Parallelism expresses really a singular idea. And you might have different components to this singular idea, but that's what's being expressed is a singular idea. These, these phrases, how many of them there are, they are parallel. That's the idea here. They go together. We're not expressing multiple different concepts out here. There's not necessarily some hidden meaning to find. So we need to make sure that we're not trying to shoehorn multiple messages into parallelism. We need, just like the parables of the New Testament, to find that central message. And as you're looking at verses 5 and 6, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, the way of the wicked will perish. What's the central idea here? The righteous have their place, and so do the wicked. 
which is the same idea from back in verses 3 and 4. The righteous are firmly planted by streams of water as this tree versus the wicked who are compared to chaff. But let me show you a better example of this and perhaps one that's a little bit more practical where we need to make sure we're not trying to shoehorn multiple messages in, into one of these examples of parallelism. Leave the book of Psalms with me real quick and go to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, perhaps one of the more favorite Proverbs in all of the book. In Proverbs 6 and verses 16, 17, 18, and 19, we have this, frame, this famous statement, These are six things which the Lord hates, and seven are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. Go back to verse 16, how it was introduced to us. These six things the Lord hates, seven are an abomination to him. Now, using the tools that we already have, we recognize now this is an example of parallelism, isn't it? These six things the Lord hates, Seven are an abomination to him. This is synthetic parallelism. Line two completing line one. But there's no hidden message here, is there? The communication, the point of verse 16 is not, here are six things that are really bad, but then this seventh thing is really bad. This isn't some form of comparison when we're uh, marking out which of these concepts is more inherently wicked than the other. The point is they're all wicked. They're all an abomination to God. Now, we're not trying to divvy up and discover which one is worse than the other. That's not the point of parallelism. There's a singular idea being communicated here. What is it in Proverbs 6, 6, uh, 6, 16? It said, hey, these are bad things. Don't do them. Now, we're going to express it in the form of six things which the Lord hates, seven are an abomination to him. That doesn't mean that this seventh thing is is not hated by God, but is, is an abomination. No, that's not the point at all. Here are things that are wicked. Because they are wicked, we're supposed to avoid them. That's the message of parallelism. We're looking for that central truth that's there for us. So go back to Psalm 1 then. Go back to Psalm 1. What's the message here? What's the message then of Psalm 1? The first message is there is truth. This is important. This is the beginning of the book of Psalms. This is placing Psalm 1 in the greater context of the book of Psalms. Knowing what we're going to read later, and then coming back and understanding this psalm in its context, one of the great points of this psalm is there is truth. There is right and there is wrong. There is truth. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law he meditates day and night. Verse 5, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, the way of the ungodly will perish. There is truth, and that truth is from God. Truth is because God is. There is a right and there is a wrong, and that right and wrong is defined by God, by what he says, and by his very nature. And as we pull one other lesson out of the, the first psalm, it's this. As we make it practical for our lives today, the righteous will stand and flourish and belong. When we're righteous, when we, when we fall into the, the category that is being described here, when we don't walk in the path of sinners, when we, don't, when we don't walk in the counsel of the wicked, when we don't stand in the path of sinners, when we don't sit in the seat of scoffers, when we delight in God's law, we find ourselves described as blessed. And part of that blessing, verse 5, is that there's an assembly of the righteous where we stand, where we belong, and it's a way, it's an assembly that God knows, that God has a relationship with. That when we choose to follow God, when we choose to bring his law into our lives and into our hearts, we have a place with him. We have a relationship with him. We don't perish like the wicked. We don't have a, 
a, a separation from God. We're, we're not fluttering like the chaff that's blown in the wind, but we're firmly planted by rivers of water. We're nourished, we're strengthened, and we prosper. Thanks for joining me today in the study of Psalm 1. We'll have some future studies coming up shortly. Have a great day.